So keeping in mind what Christina just showed, um, even though it, it's still very early stages, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about setting up the time, the academic years and terms. Um, and the first part is really setting up the academic year, and, and that's the overarching, um, sort of the highest level. Um, from there, you're going to be able to set up the holidays and instructional days. And KS will also allow for multiple academic years at an institution. Um, undergraduate programs are pretty standard, or I shouldn't say that, but they go from late August to mid-August of the following year. But a lot of times there's other programs or other schools that have academic years that have different time frames. And so we want to make sure that there's the ability to create different academic years as needed. By setting up your academic year, you're going to have a start and an end date. And terms that you're going to put into the academic year will need to fall under those timelines. Looking forward to the future, um, we know that this will definitely benefit the financial aid module. That's a very date-driven function. Um, and it will be able, you'll be able to to use the functionality um, in the module. We're, we're just trying to make sure we're always forward thinking. Now managing terms, these are subcomponents of the academic year. Um, and the idea is that you can have multiple terms within an academic year. Um, many of our schools have a fall, a spring, and summer. Um, other schools have quarters. And so we know that there's different ways to do terms. Um, and the idea is that a term would then inherit holidays and instruction from the academic year. You don't want to have to re-key those in each time. But what we put a constraint on is that the term must be within that academic year. We also have identified the concept of the subterm. And an example that we're giving is summer, se summer semester may be be divided into many different terms within the summer. That um, You can have a first term that's short, and then a second short term, and then you have a long term, which may span the length of those two shorter terms. Academic milestones are a really important concept. Um, many of these are term-based. Um, the idea I'm setting up on the term is that it would move its way down. So as you start, as we get into some of the other module discussions, um, as you start scheduling courses, you'd be able to pick up these milestones. And we know that there'll be adjust. There might be adjustments at an individual course, but that will be discussed in later training sessions. Some examples of milestones that we have in here, um, be able to define what your registration period looks like, your class add period, drop period. We know there's multiple dates on a drop period. Some may have no impact to your academic record, while others will. So that would be multiple dates. Um, when your midterm grades are, final grades, withdrawal deadline, and the census date. And we know these are not all the examples. We just wanted to make sure that we gave enough We've identified that academic milestones are really created in two different ways. So we want to make sure we allow the ability to do either way. Um, one is a discrete day. This day is the last day to add classes is September 7th. But there may be other milestone dates that are generated based on another date. So the example is the last day to add classes is 21 days after the first day of classes. So the system will be able to know that. Now, we, we, academic milestones are not inherited from term to subterm, and that's where we're at right now. Does that anyone have any questions on setting up a year or a term? Excuse me. Next, I want to talk about um, setting up time. And this is really setting up the registration environment, um, getting it ready for 
to students to be able to register. Um, there are both global and term specific rules. And some examples we have are setting what the maximum or minimum credits are per term. And there might be multiple. It might be um, for different phases of registration. You might be able to register a maximum for the first phase and then a maximum for the second phase. The ability to set up whether wait lists will count toward those maximum credits and what the mandatory advisement requirements may be. Also being able to set up some different time conflict parameters. Um, some institutions have a rule about overlapping. Overlap um, courses, other schools may not. Hey, Ruth, I'm going I'm to interrupt you. I'm sorry. I, th I think our slides got a little bit out of order in that we are getting into the next topic of setting up the registration environment. Um, that's probably my fault in putting these together. So if we can, I, I guess I would like to skip um, the slide that you were just on, slide 28, and, and hand it over to Kathy for slide 29, 30, and 31, which are really the service perspective on the academic calendar. Okay. Now that everybody's appropriately confused. <laughs> confused by that, too. I was going, wow, what should I be talking about? <laughs> 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 All right. Okay, so we just talked about the requirements on the academic calendar, setting up years and terms, and now we need to look at the service perspective on that. So have at it, Kathy. I am going to try. Oh, please. <laughs> you handle that really well, Ruth, I have to say. You <laughs> handle it like a pro. <laughs> OK, do we have visuals? <laughs> we do. Excellent. So uh, I'm, I'm going to, you know, hopefully not hurt your head too badly. Um, the, the, this part of the talk is going to be talking about this very generic concept. Well, uh, actually, I forgot. I want to, I want to back up and say something. The, the job of the services and the reason why we felt like services, why we believe that services is such an important component of how we build Kuali students is a couple of things. One, it provides that interoperability and, and between systems. That's all like kind of on the technical side, a very technical side, like systems and machines. And then there's this level of configurability. Configurability, I can't tell you how many times I've heard from Carol's group, institutionally configurable, institutionally configurable. And, and what we're doing, it really is important to be able to provide that flexibility. A lot of what you hear about type, for instance, is one way that from the service level, we enable that configurability. Another way is by providing at the, at the lowest level a very abstract service that can be modeled to support any number of business um, needs. So the ATP, or academic time period, is kind of one of those. So at the very low level, and, and I'll, I'll give you a brief orientation, Blue in the picture, or teal, blue, green, whatever you see, is the actual logical entities of the service. And then all the peachy color is really about typing. And that's how we get some of that flexibility. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide. It was more just to have the conversation we have. But there are academic time periods. There's a milestone. There's actually an entity that relates those two. And, and that's, that's kind of at the base, everything we need to support a lot of the features that you heard about in the last couple of slides. From an overall development perspective, though, as a Kuali student team, we learned a lot in R1, in, in the curriculum management work. And we're resolving that in the enrollment um, platform and approach to building out the application. So the note that says, while the service is very powerful and very flexible, even for our own internal application development folks, it can be somewhat confusing. And then even once it's not confusing, it's a bit cumbersome. So this is what's introduced. If any of you were at the, um, the first module, I talked a little bit about class, classes of services. So this is a class one 
pretty abstract, very powerful, a little cumbersome. What we've modeled on top of that is what we're calling an academic calendar service. In the academic calendar service, now when you, you, first of all, you see a lot more blue objects, which means these are actual logical entities that we're going to manage from the service perspective. So that's the first thing you'll see. The next thing you'll see is you see words you sort of recognize, like academic calendar, like campus calendar, a, a little um, bit of um, milestones that are tagged as holiday milestones. Over to the right, you'll see that term. And again, it can be quarter semesters, whatever. You'll also see this idea that we can nest the terms. So a couple of things I want to I add on to um, what Ruth was saying earlier is we can also have little terms within other terms. Many of our institutions are having maybe a five-week course within the overall semester. We don't have a good way to model that in our current system. We need to make sure as we're designing the system for the future that we have that capability from a modeling perspective. This is part of why Carol always says you need to care about services, because we're outlining capabilities that should be beyond what we're doing today. So back to the point of the service. So the point of the service is to land the plane in terms of business concepts. So this is where, again, you'll see that idea of, a, of an academic calendar. That academic calendar, typically for most of it's a year, but there's nothing that says it can't be an 18-month calendar. So this is also a, a flexible piece. And as an institution, you may have multiple of those academic calendars. The campus calendar was really a way to pull out things that aren't specific to a, a given even academic thread, like your law school versus your um, undergraduate versus maybe your um, professional business school. Um, that's where we attach things like holidays that aren't going to really differ by academic calendar. All that gets inherited then in the presentation of the overall academic calendar. Another big concept, if you go over to the right of the page, is this idea of a registration date group. We know from talking to the analysis group and the extended group of talking to institutions that there are a lot of dates that everybody has as a common set of registration dates. From a service perspective, we want to make it easy for the application developer to pick up that whole set of things. So that's really what's represented in that group down there, what actually gets um, identified, how those get labeled, whether it's a distinct milestone as a date or it's a date range, all of that is institutionally configurable. What this service allows you to do, though, is to really group that. I'll pause. I talk fast. and Great. OK, so these are just a, a couple of the notes. I think I've probably co covered most of these um, in the discussion, but this is just in case you weren't taking notes, now you can, you can have that. Um, oh, I'm done. You don't Comments? want to talk through, those, talk through those points real quick? Sure. These? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So, so terms are managed independently of academic calendars. In fact, at the lower level, they can be shared across academic calendars, if that makes sense. Um, nesting of terms, we talked a little bit about that. It can be, um, it can just be um, a nesting that doesn't constrain by date in that they're, um, like sometimes what happens with summer, they may not all be contained, but they're all nested in that that's a set of summer terms. Or they technically can be included inside within those date parameters. Um, Campus calendar, again, the idea is that that is the common stuff that's going to be shared by a number of academic calendars. I, I did sort of slide by a red box. <laughs> the red box, I'll go back. And the red box that has the location, red in our diagramming just means external to this service. It's managed somewhere else. Um, we're pretty sure that the campus calendar is going to be location specific. So even if an institution has multiple locations, they may have specific um, holidays, for instance, that are specific to that campus. Uh, again, it's, and this makes, or it's a different date. And this may happen, especially if you've got an international campus. Um, 
there is a little bit in here that's, again, as I subtitled this slide, it's probably more than you want to know. Entities have to have states. That's what allows us to basically turn things on or off or move them through a life cycle. Um, at this point, we don't see any reason to have for holidays and key dates to have states. They would inherit that from whatever the calendar or term is that they're attached to. Um, that said, calendars and terms, often you're planning one or maybe more in advance while one is still going on. So there's an official and a draft. Again, this is something we can flesh out as we get further if we need more than two states. But right now, the stake in the ground is, uh, is two states. Um, ooh, another thing. Thanks, Carol. This is probably a good reminder. So the, 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 if I go back to this picture, we talked about those registration date groups. And, and those will all be managed. But there also may be other key dates that you want to manage as one off. The beauty of the set below is that it is a set. And the power is in that set. And it lets you define en masse and retrieve and display en masse these primary things. There may also be, though, kind of more one-off dates. Our example was commencement. So what this bullet is saying is that we can also have as many of those as an institution needs um, to supplement or round out or track other key dates from which you, you would want to roll other logic as key dates. Now I'm really done. There were more nuggets in there. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Any um, questions? Anyone want to join the service team? <laughs> oh, he's recruiting. I, <laughs> I guess that, you know one thing, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more when we do an overview of um, the materials that we have. But when, when we're doing service design and we did the analysis of requirements, we weren't really considering scope because service contracts really have to accommodate not that they won't change over parallel delivery. And jump in here, Kathy, if I say anything that concerns you. But really what we're trying to do is get the service right for all of enrollment. And when, when we talk about scoping, we're really thinking more about what we're going to build out in the UI, what we're going to implement and build out. So I think when, when you're seeing a lot of capabilities now at the service layer um, that that we may or may not build out all the way to the UI in the first release of enrollment. But I think it's important to know that these, this functionality can be accommodated at the service layer. So it's, it's, it was kind of really important. Some of our big focus was making sure that we got the contract, the service contract design right, so that two years down the road, when we're ready to build out certain functionality, that, that the services can support it. I don't know if there's a better way of stating that, Kathy, but I guess I want to make the point that the services aren't looking solely at what's, you might be prioritizing according to what's in Enrollment 1 release, but the services have to think much more broadly than that. Exactly. I mean, it, it is at this layer that we believe we are truly, even, even though the, the, the ENR 1, um, Enrollment 1 motto is, you know, build the basics, deliver the basics, and then Enrollment 2 is about delivering the vision, we are designing the services as far out as we can see right now with capabilities. We'll talk at some point um, also, because we, we've used that idea that it's, it's part of the services. It's, it's enabled in the service line. But what it would take then to get that implemented also depends on the state of that contract. And I, I'll work on a slide of that, Carol, that maybe makes that a little bit more tangible so that we can okay, help great. institutions understand how to fit those deltas. Yeah, that would, that would be great. That would be great. I know this idea, you know, supported by the services becomes sort of a vague concept, you know, so that would be, that would be great. But I think the point I want to make is what you're seeing is some really um, innovative and creative thinking at the service layer. So, you know, we talk about E1, as you say, being just delivering the basics. Well, that might be true all the way to the UI, but there's a lot of visionary thinking happening down at the service layer. So that's pretty exciting. Just making a plug for services. <laughs> um, all right, the next topic on the agenda, which you already got a preview of, <laughs> um, given the, the fact that slides were out of order, is uh, setting up the registration environment. Um, 
I will pause and say I realize this is pretty dry material for the most part. I mean, the really fun stuff it will be in the next module where we talk about actually offering courses and registering students. There will be, I think, a lot more wireframes, a lot more tangible things for us to look at. But unfortunately, this is all the sort of the, the you know, back office stuff that has to happen in order for us to get to the really good stuff of enrollment. So thanks for being patient with this somewhat dry material. Although the service stuff is exciting. Um, so with that, um, Ruth, do you want to pick up at wherever the most appropriate stage is? Yep, let me just get to you. Uh... Unfortunately, so slide 32 is where I have that we're starting with the registration environment. Unfortunately, slide 28 kind of got, did not get slotted in the right spot. So you may want to start with slide 28 and then jump to 33. Very easy to follow directions there. Can you see my screen? Yep. OK. So back to 28. <laughs> um, and so this is really talking about setting up the environment um, of when students can register. Are you in present mode? Can you not see my slide? It's me. Sorry. I can. Yeah. I can. You can see it? Yeah, you're fine. Yep. You're good. OK. okay. Um, so here we have the need in, um, I can quickly go back through these, um, where the setting up the different global and, and term-specific registration rules. Um, and again, those talk about the different credits, uh, the maximum and minimum, minimum credits, um, whether or not wait lists count in those credits. So if a student signs up for a wait list, will you count that as their maximum or minimum credits per term? Um, what are the different mandatory advising requirements? What do the time conflict parameters look like? And then it's uh, um, setting up course registration fill percentages, or the min minimum registration counts um, on what is the minimum number of students which must register for a course before it's considered a go. So there might be a minimum, and then, oh, sorry, I'm reading that one wrong. <laughs> um, but, but the point of this slide is to show that there, there's some specific global rules that need to be set up before registration can occur. And so we need to account for those. Hey, Ruth, yeah. uh, this is Walter. Um, huh? uh, something that would probably only, might only apply to the US schools, but to think outside the term to maybe even like a month or what our reporting requirements are. So for example, when we report to the clearinghouse, it's once a month, and for students, and you know our reporting it's probably helpful for them to know like we can indicate like when their loan repayments would be due because they went under for the month or something like that are you kind of starting to refer to blocks walter no it's just um so for you know um centralized reporting to the national student loan clearinghouse who then re reports for loan repayment purposes, um, so there there are there are requirements that are outside the institution, basically our individual institution that may have applicability for the student. Regard registering or enrollment. Not, not so if you're looking at minimum units, it might the term itself may not be the only way you want to count. Mm. So I might I might I might be full time for the first two months of a term, but then I'm not. Then I drop a class late for some reason. Is it, I, I get. I think I'm hearing two things. One that that the well, maybe I didn't understand what the point of the dropping later. Does that then yeah, put I, the? I'll write a note. I'll write a note on it. Yeah. Why don't you throw it in the Google Doc? Yeah. Okay. And then we can follow up. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Walter.
Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about registration priority. Um, and so registration priority, we have broken down into two different parts, registration periods and then registration windows. The registration periods are really the broad points in time. Um, you define the beginning and the ending days. You may also assign specific periods to specific populations, so the athletes get the first registration period, or students with this attribute may get the first priority, graduating seniors, um, or incoming freshmen may get the last priority. You have the ability to set the, the period for a specific population, um, and we know that the multiple periods need to be supported. Um, I'm going to punt to, on the when are registration tools available to the student. Um, and unless, Carol, you wanted to say something on that one. I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'm going uh, to. <laughs> that's quite all right. Um, no, I don't. I mean, what this really refers to, uh, there, there's sort of different layers, and we'll get into this more in our, in our next session when we look at student registration, but there's different layers of tools that we're envisioning that students will have in order to be able to register. One is very, sort of your just basic um, one-click registration. The next level up would be your registration cart, um, very similar to an Amazon-type concept. Moving one layer back out, we envision something along the lines of a schedule builder where you can say, you know, here are, the, here are the classes I'm interested in taking, here's my order of preference, here are the times that I'm not available, show me what my options are. And then kind of backing out even one layer further, we might have registering um, from an academic tool such as your learning plan. So I think what, what this is referring to is when might you may want to set different dates um, around when each of these tools would be available to students for particular terms in order to actually access. So that might be the type of some of the priority setting that, that you might do around, around the tools. Probably will make more sense when we get into course registration, but yeah. Is that okay, Ruth? So. Yeah, thank you. Um, the second part to this is really establishing the register window, and this is now a discrete time. Um, it could have a beginning time and ending time on a specific date. For example, at 9 a.m. May 25th, I, ha I will be allowed to register. Um, some institutions may not use an end date, so once your time starts, you may be able to register at any given time. But this is actually putting the discrete time on um, the registration. This is also referred to often as the appointment for when a student can register. And this is done for a variety of reasons. Um, I think on some old systems, there was a load issue on how many students could register at a time. There's also a pacing issue of who get, of what students should be given a top priority to get into certain, to have the ability to get into smaller classes. And so why people do this is, is for a variety of reasons. but. The end result is we know we need to support this. Yeah, and that's been one of the interesting things about talking about registration priority is, you know, if we, if we look at our current business, a lot of it is based on load balancing and definitely some pedagogical reasons, but a lot of it has to do with load balancing. So it's trying to untangle, like, well, what if, what if you didn't have to worry as much about load? You know, what are the things you still want to preserve versus what are the things that you would change? So that's been kind of fun. you know, fun in quotes. <laughs> All right. Um, we have schedule of validity criteria. Um, and this is some examples of when a student is actually Registering for classes, we want to be able to give them feedback on whether this is going to work or not. Um, some of the examples are, are is the student exceeding the maximum credit hours? Um, do they have time, click, time conflicts? We know that student athletes often have some different requirements um, as far as what their, their uh, workload is. Um, 
So we want to be able to give feedback to an athlete. Um, international students, again, they might have different requirements, uh, the minimum amount of courses they're required to take in order to be eligible for their status. There's definitely impact to financial aid eligibility, and this is in italics because where that's going to lie, um, especially for the E1, is undetermined. There's the full-time and part-time status, um, the number of courses that you're required to take to maintain a full-time status versus a part-time status. And then we have the travel time between classes. And that's a little bit, uh, we need some more investigation on that and how that's going to work. To work. Um, but we've identified requirements where if your travel time from one course to the next course exceeds the, I think it was 15 minutes, we want to be able to warn the student. So here again in the setup of the environment, it's really about setting up what these rules look like. Sorry, Carol. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, yeah, and backing up just a, a little bit, uh, again, it is about setting up these rules from a registration environment perspective. And there's, when you think about eligibility, registration eligibility, you can kind of think about it in three buckets. And we'll reinforce this again when we get to, to course registration. There is the, am I, am I eligible to register? Meaning, is it my time to register? And that's what the, the slide, um, the registration priority slide was about. It's about setting up those rules that um, dictate when a student is actually eligible to register. But that has nothing really to do about what they're trying to register for. It's just, am I, can I register, period. Okay, so that's one bucket of stuff. The next bucket of stuff is, um, can I register for this particular course? And those are course eligibility requirements. So we'll talk primarily when we get to course offering in the next um, module about that bucket of stuff, and it really answers the question, can this particular student register for this particular course? So that's your second bucket. And then your third bucket is, all right, now that I've, it's, I'm able to register, it's my time, I'm able to register for, for each of these individual courses, but collectively, is my schedule valid? And so that's that third bucket of, like, you may, a student may be eligible for each individual course but maybe they've gone over some maximum credit. Maybe there isn't enough travel time in their schedule. Uh, maybe it goes over some financial uh, aid requirements of some sort. So, you know, there's kind of three buckets of eligibility criteria that we can think about. And when we think about setting up the environment, we're really talking about that first bucket of setting up when students can register and that third bucket of saying, here's some global criteria around what schedules are valid. That middle bucket of can a student register for an individual course offering, we'll talk about um, in the next module. I don't know if that clarifies or makes it more confusing, but uh, that's the sort of the levels that we're thinking about when it comes to registration eligibility. Okay then. <laughs> okay. Um, Next, we're going to talk a bit about holds and exemptions. Um, the first part is understanding what a block is. And so that's an action based on a real-time evaluation that would prevent a student from doing a specific activity. Um, an example include it'll block a student from registering for a juniors only course if the student is a sophomore. Um, and this block is, is on a student's record for a period of time. Once it's removed, then the student would be updated. Um, the conditions of the blocks are met, and or the student receives an exemption, which would be a way to bypass that block. So I think now, so there's. We talked about blocks, which are sort of instantaneous ways to keep a student from, from moving forward with some action. And then we can also talk about um, holds. And I think we actually have some wireframes around holds. So Christina was going to maybe show us at least some early sketches around what setting up holds would look like. That's what that next slide is. Yeah, OK.
Okay, am I sharing the, the right screen here? Looks like it. So um, around setting up holes, there is there's kind of two two spaces of or two concepts of setting up the holes. One would be setting up the holes in a very general space, and the second would be actually applying it to students. So what we're talking about here is just that first bit, the setting up setting up the parameters, what the hold is, and how a person would remove it. So in the application map, um, this is this is where you <laughs> where we are for that. Um, and then there are some wireframes for this. And this is, this first one is just a swim lane of the kind of the entire process of configuring the hold, um, configuring how scheduled or applied to people, the placing of the holes, notification resolution. And again, this, this piece today is just about this first bit, the setting up, configuring the holes. So again, here's a this is a very early sketch about how how you might go about setting up a hole. Some of the things that you'd have to do is select who what kind of hold is, who's going to own, administer and own the hold, be able to name the hold that they needed um, advising hold put a description in, um, and then the criteria that would that would qualify someone to be a candidate for this. And this is gonna this would launch the rules a rules interface where you could set up very specific rules to, to identify the students that are um, meeting those meet, that would meet that criteria. So based on their class level, classes they're taking, any kind of thing that, that would um, allow them to meet the criteria for that. And then what the whole might restrict. Once there is, once you've identified the students who meet that whole, then what what does it actually do to them? Is that going to block them from registration? Is it going to block them from getting registration appointment, getting their transcript, some other other thing that, that you can restrict or, or block, or something that's determined at the time of placement. Then there's notes on how the hold could be listed, and then the trigger, where it's, whether it's an automatic something was user triggered. So if it's automatic trigger, then that would be something that the system would automatically place the hold and um, or forward candidates for the appropriate department to to review, and then you can pick that based on a date or a specific milestone. Um, and so, so something like this would be how the central or department admin or the person who, who's setting up this hold would create a, a reusable hold that could be applied to, to multiple students. And we imagine this so, is something that might happen once, twice, every couple of years. I mean, I think once you get your hold uh, catalog set up, I don't, you know, there probably isn't a lot of activity around adding new types of holds once you kind of have them in place. So, Probably not a high yeah. frequency activity, but you know, obviously need the ability to set up a holes that can be subsequently applied to students. Yeah, the much higher frequency would be actually applying. It. Applying them, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> applying holes and taking it off, but this setup is, is just how you yeah. how you set it up so yeah. it can be. Yep. So let's see. Client students is a separate feature. Um, and I think that that's all for, for the screens of this. Are there any questions around this or anything I can answer? Okay. Again, the point of showing you these wireframes is to give you a sense of the concept that we're actually talking about here. So where we have some wireframes that help exemplify this concept, that's why we're, we're showing them. So it's like, oh, okay, now I get what you're talking about. So thank you, Christina. Very helpful. I think we have Steve back much to our delight.